uh, let's get started. I'm going to switch over to a slide deck, but even before starting, I just wanted to say hi, kind of off a slide deck, uh, and let you just know on the Facebook page for MTHFR, there have been a lot of questions, more than usual, over the last couple of weeks. And sometimes for me, I'll just go over there and answer the questions, or somebody on the team will answer the questions. It seemed like given the number of questions, it's easier to jump online with a webinar. And I'll tell you, my goal today is really two things. One, to walk us through some slides with the idea of clarifying some of the more commonly asked questions. And then second of all, to go through the questions that everybody has been asking. Uh, I put something out there on the Facebook page, uh, just letting everybody know if you have questions, go ahead and tell me and I'll make sure to get them answered. Okay, so with that, let me go ahead and start the slide deck. Again, my goal is not to do a million slides. Uh, instead, it's really to answer a lot of questions. Okay. All right. So what are we talking about today? Uh, MTHFR, my goal is to answer some of the more common questions and really get to the root of some of the most common confusions. Who am I? Uh, my name is Amy Hedemio. I'm the scientific director of MTHFR experts. Uh, we're the ones that run the Facebook page. Uh, I do have a functional clinic in Miami. It's called Body Science. Uh, it's been in business, gosh, about 12 years, seeing inflammatory related conditions, MTHFR being at the top of that list. And then finally, Biome IQ, uh, which is about MTHFR supplements. And the reason for me to have an affiliation with that uh, just to find clean supplements and things that I know are going to work, things that I already use in my office, uh, things that I can see work so I know how to titrate them. So those are my disclaimers and, and conflicts. Why am I personally passionate about MTHFR? So imagine I have a functional clinic dealing with inflammatory disorders, a blog specifically on MTHFR, and on top of it, I oversee the selection of supplements for folks that have MTHFR. Uh, so I'm sure you're probably scratching your head and saying, wow, this woman is very focused on MTHFR. Um, I'll tell you my own personal story. I expect most of you have similar stories. Uh, I had a handful of MTHFR-related issues when I was a young kid, uh, emotionally, mostly, lots of anxiety, and difficulty right after puberty. Um, the bigger issue for me, uh, the thing that really brought MTHFR to light uh, my mom had a history of miscarriages. Um, when I grew up with my mom, it was a relatively easy, normal childhood. When my mom went through menopause, so I was just about in college at the time, I was finishing high school, uh, it was terrible for her. She went through huge bouts of depression and anxiety. Gynecologically, she had a lot of problems. She developed thyroid dysregulation and blood sugar dysregulation, and I didn't know why, and she didn't know why, uh, my dad didn't know why. And so uh, we went to all the places, I'm sure a lot of you have already been, uh, her general practitioner that said, you know, I'm not sure what the problem is, but maybe start an antidepressant, gynecology that said, you know, I don't know why your periods are changing this much and why they're so heavy and clotty and maybe think about some corrective action that we can do over there. That went back and forth for a period of time until, I don't recall which, but one of those two folks had the brilliant idea of uh, psychiatry. Uh, not a good thing, not a bad thing, but uh, psychiatry had said, you know, you're suffering with depression and anxiety uh, and let me make changes to medications. My mom was a history of somebody that never had any of those issues. She never had thyroid dysregulation. She didn't have blood sugar dysregulation, so pre-diabetes. Uh, she never had a history of anxiety and depression to that, to that degree. Uh, and what she really had was an MTHFR mutation, which accounted for all of those symptoms. And had it been addressed as MTHFR, uh, chances are she wouldn't have spent so many I would call them desperate years, uh, trying medication after medication and suffering with the symptoms of MTHFR. So for me, it became a mission uh, to try and get an understanding of what may be causing those problems. Uh, about 10 years ago, I'd opened a functional clinic. And for me, functional medicine is really looking at the underlying culprit. It's not the disease. 
it's not even the symptoms. It's at the cell level, what's actually causing the problem. And that's when MTHFR really came to my radar, the fact that there is a SNP or genetic mutation that predisposes somebody to difficulty with removing toxins, right? Because MTHFR is a detoxification error. And that's when it became very clear. The other symptoms that she was dealing with, they were symptoms of toxicity that were really leading to widespread dysregulations, primarily hormonal. And the time I think I really knew I was going to move forward and do something about it, again, uh, with my mom, we'd gone through so many physicians and just clinicians in general um, that didn't have an idea and didn't know how to treat. It was when my mom uh, was feeling achy and just generally bad, getting headaches routinely. I saw my niece, uh, she was about 17 at the time, Mackenzie. She's one of the ones, she's one of the people that writes the blogs for MTHFR experts for us. Uh, she'd had an MTHFR kind of childhood, uh, similar to my own anxiety and mood swings and just, just difficulty uh, through puberty. And so both of them were on a detox. There's a detox that I use in my office for MTHFR just to try and get folks clean and then start from scratch and rebuilding a methylation pathway. Uh, they were both on the detox at the same time. We were eating breakfast at the house and I realized, I think I'm going to do something about this, right? This can't continue where there are so many people that are affected uh, and so oftentimes little focus or such difficulty finding uh, experts in this field. So that kind of gives you my story. As a team, I'll tell you, uh, the medical director is an MD. Uh, the researcher on our team is a PhD. I'm a sci I am the scientific director. Together, we run Body Science, which is a large functional medicine clinic. Uh, we're located in Miami, Florida. Uh, we focus not just on MTHFR, but anything else inflammatory. So whether we're talking about Hashimoto's, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lupus, I have a large ALS clinic. Um, Anything that is kind of the outcropping of inflammation, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's fit into that category. Uh, but of course, a uh, favorite of mine is MTHFR because it's one of the most predisposing factors for a number of those other conditions. Okay, I think most of you that are on this call can relate to these kinds of symptoms. And what I wanna really say is these are in truth, they're not symptoms of MTHFR. They're symptoms of the fact that MTHFR as a mutation interferes with and decreases the ability of the detoxification pathway. And so these are symptoms of, detox, of toxins that have gotten in that can't properly detoxify and hormones that dysregulate because of those toxins that aren't able to get out. So migraines, migraines and fatigue, they're just classic, classic uh, symptoms of toxicity. Uh, irregular periods for women because of the estrogen dominance. I saw a lot of you ask questions about miscarriages and fertility, so we'll talk more about that. It is not exclusively something that affects women uh, for men having testosterone convert into estrogen and then estrogen building up the same way it does in women. So both men and women, girls and boys are affected. Uh, but a common thing to see in women is irregular periods. So either periods that are too frequent or don't occur frequently enough, or just very, very clotty, very crampy, very painful menstruation. Uh, hot flashes can be common. Weight gain or easy weight gain with difficulty in weight loss Poor focus, poor concentration. Uh, lots of women, the more toxic they get, and men as well, the older they get. So the more they accumulate toxins, the more focus and concentration difficulty people will have. Again, fatigue is right up there when you're thinking about uh, toxicity. Uh, skin problems, so uh, acne, and facial hair as well. Uh, anxiety, insomnia, depression, those kinds of moods are often related to MTHFR. And finally, inflammation, which is really the underlying culprit behind all of it. Okay, I put this slide over here for two reasons. Oh, sorry, guys, let me go back. Uh, thing number one, I think a lot of us have had that face before if we deal with MTHFR. And for all the men and boys that are on the on the on that call. Uh, I'm sorry, I really should have put both. Um, but here's the point. 
about 40% of the population has at least one copy of an MTHFR mutation. And so the question is, because this mutation is so prevalent, how come only certain people are really affected by it? And it has to do with two things, exposures and your particular MTHFR genetic combination. And we'll go through them because I think it will help to really clarify uh, what the difference is in the genotypes. Okay, so just to give you a, a background, hang on, let me just try and move. I've got a piece on the front of my screen. I just need to move it out of my way. Uh, this is the busiest of all the slides. It's the only time I'll put something up that has so many things to read. Um, but I think these are the four really important pillars when it comes to understanding MTHFR. So number one, it predisposes people to become toxic more quickly than the average person, right? Everybody at this point is being exposed to pesticides, chlorine and fluorine in the water, parabens and phthalates in creams, makeup, um, shampoo. Uh, most people at this point have had organophosphate pesticide, even if you try and eat organic veggies. Uh, polychlorinated biphenols should be out of the environment. Uh, they were banned back, I believe it was the 70s, but they are still commonly found when you uh, eat animal meat. So the question is not whether or not you can remove all toxins. The question is, can you improve limited detoxification resulting from MTHFR? And that's what we'll talk about. Uh, thing number two, glands are the first area of the body to become toxic. They absorb toxins faster than other parts of the body. All right, that's the reason that there is commonly a thyroid dysregulation. For women, ovarian dysregulation. For men, testicular dysregulation. The pancreas is normally involved, so blood sugar dysregulation toxins absorb, absorb into glands very quickly. And so gland-related dysregulations and the diseases that occur, so PCOS, Hashimoto's, um, androgen-related issues in young men, um, poor testicular production in men, uh, all of those things are consequences of glands in individuals with MTHFR that become dysregulated. Uh, point number three, the long and short, uh, everybody has genetics from their mom and their dad. Uh, you have certain weak points, and that means that those areas are the most likely to, breast, to, to break under stress. So uh, stress can be not eating for long periods of time. It can be eating too much sugar. It can be not getting sleep for extended periods of time. It could be work or personal related stress. But the more stress you put into a body, the more the genetic predispositions are likely to come out and start creating problems. And then finally, how do you know uh, where the first issues are going to show up? Uh, and the thing is you can normally trace your family history. So if you're a man and your mom had thyroid condition and your grandmother did too, uh, and you're a poor detoxifier, thyroid may be the first thing that shows up for you. If you're a woman and you have a mom and a grandmom that suffered with fertility issues, uh, if they've already had hysterectomies and then you find that you're dealing with menstrual issues, again, that's the genetic predisposition. Uh, the dirtier you get, the more toxins you accumulate, the more MTHFR becomes a limiting factor because you can't remove those toxins, the more dysregulations you're going to see in the areas that you are genetically or familially most susceptible to. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Uh, let's just a brief talk about thyroid and MTHFR, and I'll show you the slide after this, uh, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So let's discuss those two. And the reason, let's talk symptoms, because I think commonly a lot of thyroid-related symptoms in somebody that's already tested for MTHFR, it's assumed that they're MTHFR symptoms, but they're not. MTHFR, again, is just a detoxification mutation. And to take one step back, I would tell you in my own clinic, I don't typically refer to it as a mutation. I don't really see it as a bad thing. Instead, MTHFR for everybody on this call is your superpower. I know you may not see it like that, 
I know MTHFR at this point may just be the bane of your existence, uh, putting you in a situation where you're dealing with so many symptoms. But if I had to guess evolutionarily the benefit of MTHFR, do you realize if we got 100 people in a room, 50 of us have an MTHFR mutation and the other 50 don't? And there's a toxin that comes into that room. R50, the, the, the MTHFR folks, we're the first ones to know that there's a problem, right? Uh, we're going to have mood swings. We're going to have anxiety. We're going to feel kind of depressed. We're going to get lots of fatigue. We might have low-grade headaches. We may feel achy. No matter what, chances are we're going to leave the room. Right? We're not going to stay in the room that has poison in it because what we actually have is a warning. Our bodies are equipped with a warning. And for everybody else, they're going to stay in that room and continue to accumulate toxins until they develop a real medical problem. Okay, so on the MTHFR side, if that's the case, if this is really a way of our bodies to say, hey, there's too much toxic burden, be aware, identify it, and eliminate it, right? Because that's really what the symptoms are saying. Then on our side, our first priority is really to get an understanding when these symptoms come up of what may be in our environment. And our first approach should be that, right? Not treating, not medicating, but kind of getting a sense of, uh, are there a lot of heavy metals accumulating? Have I been eating a lot of fish lately? Uh, have I been using more and more makeups that may have parabens or phthalates? Uh, did I use a medication that requires a methylation pathway uh, birth control pills for estrogen, and then estrogen requires methylation. So what I'm suggesting is not to start or stop medication. What I'm suggesting is not to necessarily move somewhere to a new home. What I am saying is when a symptom shows up, consider the fact that it is your body reacting and trying to warn you about the fact that there's something that is toxic and that toxic is accumulating. So a th the thyroid uh, it's the top gland when it comes to really dysregulating for toxins. It's the energy for the body, right? The thyroid is going to make T4, uh, which is going to circulate and become T3 for the cells that need energy. And when a body becomes inflamed and a body is under high chronic stress and somebody has MTHFR, thyroids are going to commonly dysregulate. So symptoms include Temperature dysregulation, uh, the thyroid's real job is to maintain a 98.6 body temperature no matter what the actual temperature is that you're sitting in. So I could go to zero degrees uh, and my body would still regulate to 98.6. I could go to 100 degrees and my body would still regulate down to 98.6. It's going to do that by increasing and decreasing the metabolism, right? So if I need to get warm, my metabolism is going to speed up. If I need to get cooler to cool down in a hot situation, my metabolism is going to slow down. And when a body is under chronic stress, uh, so again, uh, from toxins, uh, from lack of sleep, from food that has too many pesticides, from too much fluorine and chlorine, uh, and heavy metals and all kinds of other chemicals, when a body is under that degree of stress and a thyroid dysregulates, it is going to down regulate the amount of energy to cells. So fatigue is going to be pretty common. Uh, water retention is going to be pretty common. So for some people, they'll have uh, kind of bags under their eyes or scalloping on either side of their tongue. Uh, and you might feel water retention in your hands and feet. Uh, thyroid has a lot to do with anxiety and depression. And most people that have a sluggish thyroid or even a, a very fast thyroid will feel anxiety and depressed moods. Uh, because, again, we're talking about temperature, uh, hot flashes, and as well, feeling cold, cold hands, cold feet, cold intolerance when you go to the grocery store and you walk down the cold aisle. Uh, those are thyroid-related issues, but keep in mind, if you are an individual that has MTHFR and you develop a thyroid dysregulation, it is not likely a primary, meaning there may not be a thyroid problem instead an MTHFR-related buildup in toxins that prevents the thyroid from working properly. So addressing MTHFR is one of your primary focuses in controlling thyroid. 
and then mood and mayhem, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. So uh, here's the thing. Progesterone and testosterone belong to the same family. They are luteinizing hormones. Here's what they do. They make the world feel generally like a good place. They give a sense that things are okay. Uh, they prevent the sense of being overwhelmed, uh, and they create a good mood. They help build muscle. They help prevent excess body fat. They keep skin young and thick uh, to avoid fine lines and wrinkles. Um, they improve sleep uh, and prevent lots of wake-ups. Okay, by comparison, let's talk estrogen. And no, both men and women have estrogen. A couple really important points here. Thing number one, testosterone in both men and women can be converted into estrogen under stress. That's thing one. Thing number two, out of these three hormones, only one of them, estrogen, requires methylation for removal. So in people that have a methylation deficiency, right? And so everybody that has an MTHFR mutation fits into that category, right? We're not able to properly methylate. So for that reason, most of us are susceptible to higher estrogen because we can't methylate it out and lower levels of progesterone and testosterone by comparison to that estrogen because those do not require the methylation pathway. And so one key point to put over here, it's not that these levels are high or low. It is their relative ratio. You are estrogen dominant when estrogen level far exceeds progesterone and or testosterone. So progesterone in a woman and testosterone in a man. And remember, under stress, testosterone can be converted down the aromatase pathway into estrogen and estrogen must be methylated for removal. And so estrogen dominance becomes common. So here's what estrogen dominance looks like. Uh, first of all, for all of the women that are on this call, uh, ladies, it looks like PMS. Uh, mood swings, poor focus, poor concentration, difficulty uh, sleeping, snappishness. Uh, for men, um, it feels like, and, and women, oftentimes, realizing your personality is very sensitive, e even more so over time that you kind of internalize feelings uh, that, that you hold them deep in your heart and, and not in a good way, <laughs> but, you know, kind of in a way of, huh, I wonder what that really means. I wonder what that person really meant to say, that kind of thing. When progesterone is low and estrogen is elevated at the same time, ruminating thoughts become common. I can't tell you how many folks have come on down to body science thinking that they had OCD, uh, because they keep having the same thoughts kind of go round and round. Ruminating thoughts and high anxiety are hallmarks of low progesterone. And because we're talking about not one hormone dysregulation, but oftentimes multiple, so the reproductive hormones that we're looking at here on the screen, as well as thyroid, and because thyroid dysregulation also shares a degree of anxiety and depression, along with low motivation, there's no surprising the fact that people that have MTHFR, when it's uncontrolled, typically get kind of walloped in that area. Uh, and so again, fatigue, achiness, poor focus, poor concentration, uh, difficulty thinking and working through uh, difficult situations, trying to stay awake throughout the whole day, trying to sleep well at night, uh, that can become an MTHFR life. However, thinking back to the slide earlier, the fact that 40% of people have MTHFR, I think it's critical to point out humans have been living with MTHFR for who knows how long, and they have not necessarily had these symptoms. The issue is not the MTHFR mutation. That's just the genetic predisposition. It's the fact that the environment and the accumulation of toxins is turning that mutation, something that could be a superpower, right? Alert you to a toxic environment in order for you to leave it. MTHFR is essentially turned on and aggravated as toxins accumulate and the double-edged sword toxins accumulate because of MTHFR. Remember, this is a methylation deficiency, but it really is a detoxification error. 
We're talking about phase two liver detoxification and the fact that the methylation pathway is not working properly. Okay, so now let's actually talk about what that means and let's look at a handful of uh, MTHFR cases. Again, I had to move. I've got one piece on my screen that shows me uh, the settings for Zoom. It seems to continually be right in my way. Okay, here's what you're looking at. Uh, you're look, first of all, this is a uh, body science MTHFR test result. Uh, and so in the MTHF, uh, MTHFR store, uh, if you'd wanted, you could go over there. They are buckle swabs. Uh, for me, it really doesn't make a difference where you get a test from. Uh, what I want to make sure on our lab results is that they're very, very clear and easy to read. Uh, and we're a you're able to always contact our office so we can walk you through them. So here's what you're looking at. You're looking at a negative result. This is somebody that does not have MTHFR. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, uh, both the genotypes at the top are negative, and most importantly, this sentence over here that kind of summarizes uh, this patient carries neither uh, an A or C mutation. Okay, so the real key is this part down here. It means they have a 100% methylation ability. So folate reductase, and that's the enzyme that's being referred to over here, works at 100%. And so if you take in a reasonable exposure of toxins, heavy metals, for example, are in the soil. Bodies are designed to remove heavy metals. There are a lot of toxins that bodies are designed to detoxify for. MTHFR is a detoxification mechanism. So as far as are you going to come in contact with toxins, yes, you are. If you don't have MTHFR, you have enough folate reductase to methylate properly, in which case you make 100% of your capacity to detoxify down the methylation pathway. Okay, so now let's look at another. What you can see is one copy of an A1298C and none of the, of, of the copy neither of the copy, not a copy for a c 677 Okay, so this person has a one, a single copy of a mutation. Uh, it's an A variant, and you can see as a result, they have a slight reduction in the ability to methylate. So if the person that doesn't have a mutation at all is at 100%, somebody that has a single A copy can still methylate and methylate well, they have a slight reduction, so they are able to methylate 83%. So if you think about what's really happening is 83% of the time, that person feels great. And 17% of the time, they often suffer with the same symptoms as anybody with MTHFR or toxicity. If we look at the next one, so now what you can see is this is not an A mutation. Instead, it's one C677T mutation. And C mutations are more significant as far as a methylation reduction than A. So just kind of summarizing, no mutation, uh, best case scenario, it means that you can always methylate. Anybody that has an MTHFR mutation, consider that you have a different pathway that you're better at that is upregulated. Okay, uh, as far as the least affected, it's a single A copy, which is what we just saw. The next in that line is a single C copy. And so now what you're looking at is somebody that can detoxify properly 66% of the time, that's their enzyme activity. The other 44% of the time, uh, they struggle. And so this is where you really want to start focusing on uh, toxins in your environment and reducing them. One step further, what you're looking at is somebody that has an A copy and a C copy. And you can see that 52% of the time, this person is not able to make that folate reductase enzyme properly, and the methylation pathway is not working. So 48% of the time, they are able to detoxify. So now what we're really looking at, if we're kind of uh, just, just uh, round, 50-50, right? And half the time they feel great, and half the time they don't. And then finally, and I understand that there's an A and a C mutation. Uh, this last one, though, is a double C copy, right? So you can see a zero A1298C and two of the C677T mutations. This is the person that's the most affected and as well has the association with homocysteine, meaning they can create an inflammatory burden 
that can or has been associated with cardiovascular changes. Uh, and so they may have already identified themselves because of family history of cardiovascular disease or stroke. These are the people that have the most um, important role in detoxifying. These are the folks that need the most amount of methylation support, right? Because again, they can make the methylation enzyme, the enzyme to turn that process on, folate reductase, 25% of the time and the remaining 75% they can't. So these are typically the folks that are most symptomatic. However, if you have somebody with a double C mutation that really never comes in contact with toxins and you have somebody with a single A mutation that's living in a very dirty area as far as lots of pesticides on their fruits and veggies, uh, lots of high stress, lots of inflammatory burden, symptomatically, they're going to be much worse than a double C copy. All right. So I hope those three kind of give you a better sense. And I'm going to go back through them one more time. I think out of everything that we're looking at, this part is probably the, the thing that's going to become clearest as far as everybody understanding MTHFR. So going back to negative, remember, what's making you sick is not MTHFR. It's the genetic mutation MTHFR in combination with exposures and toxins. And what that's going to do is cause hormone systems to dysregulate. And those are the symptoms that you're going to feel. It doesn't mean if somebody does not have MTHFR that they could not become toxic. If you're in a toxic enough environment, you can no matter what. But as well, it does mean if you do not have an MTHFR mutation, uh, you are able to detoxify better than somebody that does. Okay, so this is somebody that does not have a mutation and as a result, 100% of folate reductase activity. This is somebody that has uh, one of the, of the least affected, so an A versus a C, right? An A being a more mild version of MTHFR, right, at 83%. And as well, let me just tell you personality-wise what I see in my office. I don't see a link to this in literature, but anecdotally, what I routinely see a copies have a lot more to do with mood and hormones like estrogen, testosterone. When I see women that have had uh, issues with their menstruation, they've had to go on birth control in order to control heavy, bleedy periods. They have a family history of hysterectomies. Uh, that's commonly an A copy and sometimes even just a single A copy. Uh, when I see parents and they bring their children in and it's a, a boy commonly suffering with attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, it's commonly an A. C by comparison looks really inflammatory. So whether it's achiness, achy joints, whether it's uh, diseases of inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, lupus, uh, so again, I would tell you not so much from the literature, but if you're asking anecdotally over 10 years, uh, what do I normally see as far as a personality, A versus C? A is commonly my folks that have difficulty with focus and concentration. It's commonly my estrogen dominant men and women, easy to gain weight, hard to lose weight. Uh, for women, they suffer with menstruation. For men, oftentimes they don't have enough testosterone and sometimes develop gynecomastia or the fatty tissue uh, in the chest for that reason. And again, C by comparison just looks really inflammatory. Uh, okay. And then here was our single copy of a C. Here is our copy one and one. And finally a double C copy. Okay. Just a couple things to think about. And then we're almost at the end of, uh, of the slides. That way we can get to questions. Uh, thing number one, folate versus folic acid. A lot of folks had asked, oh, guys, I'm sorry. Give me a sec. Let me just find a plug. I think I'm just about out of battery. Hold on. All right. You would think I would have prepared that. I thought I plugged my laptop in, uh, but clearly I didn't. So now let me just get us plugged in. Give me a quick sec. Hang on for me. Thank you. All right. So, do you like that? Is that a lack of professionalism, possibly? <laughs> okay, here we go, folate versus folic acid. Uh, folic acid is referred to in the literature as uh, UMFA, or unmetabolized folic acid, when we're talking about MTHFR. It means this, 
it means folic acid is synthetic. Uh, it's added largely to foods. Uh, it's common in vitamins. It's a supplement. When you see something that says uh, vitamins included in this oatmeal, it's not folate, which is the natural B vitamin. Instead, it's folic acid. And for us that have MTHFR, we are very, very finicky. We do not like folic acid. We don't like synthetic things in general, right? We're poor detoxifiers. So uh, keeping synthetic things, including synthetic vitamins, out of our world becomes important. Folate is a natural B vitamin. Folate is not a problem for people that have MTHFR. In fact, people that have MTHFR require usually larger amounts of folate because they can't properly methylate it because they are missing folate reductase as an enzyme. So you've already seen something, it's usually called a five prime MTHF. It's the methylated form of folate that we absorb better if we have MTHFR. And by comparison, folic acid is a synthetic vitamin that we do not methylate well and makes people with MTHFR sick. And the ratio of folate to folic acid has a lot to do with how you're going to feel if you have MTHFR. So there's two things to do. Number one, make sure you have enough folate, one, because you're eating it. And secondly, if you would choose to supplement it, so a 5-MTHF, right, that methyl tetrahydrofolate vitamin. And what you want to do as well, so thing number two, which is as important, you must reduce or eliminate as much as possible folic acid. Folic acid was added into foods uh, to reduce neural tube defects as a birth defect. As a result, most processed food includes that synthetic vitamin. If you're taking a multivitamin that has folic acid, stop. If you are pregnant, you're taking your prenatals and it has folic acid, stop. If you have kids that are in school and it's as if they do fine and then they eat and afterwards they become kind of crazy, consider that there's probably a lot of folic acid in there. What I normally use with the kids that come on down is a lozenge that has both B12 and a methylated form of folate. Kids know when they have folic acid on board, they ate it in a school lunch or they ate it in some kind of packaged chips. And so I like when they keep that lozenge. It's a, just a little like a cherry flavored candy, but it's not, it's a vitamin. Uh, and I like when they have it so they could take it before it tests if focus and concentration is not as sharp as it should be. I think that's over at the MTHFR store if you're looking for it. Um, secondly, so that's thing number one, folate versus folic acid. So what we know in summary is, avoid folic acid. And if you come in contact with it, balance it out with as much folate as you can. It's the ratio of those two things that are going to dictate how you feel. Uh, the more folic acid you have, the more foggy, poor focus, poor concentration, uh, just generally MTHFR-ish. Uh, what is methylation? We talked about it briefly, but let me just uh, go over it again. It is a form of detoxification. It is a methyl group or a carbon with three hydrogens. It has an extra place on it. Carbons can carry up to four hydrogens. So that extra place is used to grab onto toxins and remove them. Uh, however, for anybody with MTHFR, that methylation pathway is not as robust. There isn't as much folate reductase to activate that, that methylation pathway. Uh, thing number three, how to supplement. Uh, I tried on the, um, at the MTHFR store to give a lot of recommendations when it comes to what is your genotype and so what dosing would I use in my office given that genotype. Uh, there's always questions I see on the Facebook page, overmethylating versus undermethylating. Uh, you don't want to do either. You just want to get the proper amount of methylation given your mutation and given your environmental exposure. So what I like I like pure methylation. That's normally my go-to. Uh, it's on that site. Um, and then finally, when is it time to detox? I'll show you the detox. I think it's right below this. It's the one that I use. Um, but if you're comfortable using a different detox or if you've got a naturopath or a physician that likes a different detox, I've used this one for about 10 years. Uh, it's my go-to. So what we're talking about is a way to improve methylation pathways. Uh, you're looking at... Um, let me think, a SNP that just came right off of the MTHFR store. The digestive enzymes, I'll tell you the reason. 
whenever you're going to detoxify and we're talking about a liver pathway, so methylation, the liver is going to take most of its toxins once they've been processed and dump them into the intestines for elimination through the intestines. If you are somebody on this call and you have belly related issues, so lots of constipation or even lots of diarrhea, just a history of belly stuff, it is likely the fact that poorly methylated toxins, so unpackaged toxins, toxins that have not been packaged in a way to protect the intestines have come through the liver, they've been dumped into the intestines, and now they're gonna create a lot of intestinal inflammation. So one key point, if you are going to do a detox, you're always going to want to make sure if you are somebody who is not moving your bowels daily, you're going to want to do, uh, take digestive enzymes and reduce inflammation until you're able to move your bowels, at which point you're going to do a, a detox. And so here's how I know that somebody needs a detox rather than just starting supplements. It's a question of how symptomatic they are. So no matter how much methyl you put on, uh, you can't get rid of giant amount of toxins, in my experience, unless you detox. So the way I look at that, it's like a tub filled with water. And the question is, uh, if you have a, a teaspoon to remove all the water, how long will it take? Taking methylation in the form of a methyl pill, when you have very advanced toxic burden with MTHFR, rarely works. It's like you can't get enough methylation support. And then when you keep increasing and increasing and increasing that methylation, now you have too many Bs and you feel overstimulated. So for me at that point, my goal is not to put something in, it's to bring something out, take something out. So remember, you're toxic. Adding even vitamins into a toxic burden is not really the first step. Instead, if you can reduce the toxic burden. So I'll give you another example. Uh, if in my office we're going to use um, bioidentical hormone therapy for a woman that is estrogen dominant or a man that has low testosterone because he is estrogen dominant, I'll usually look to do a detox before using those hormones because I'm not really trying to drive progesterone or testosterone up to a level to match this unusually high estrogen Instead, ideally, we'll bring the estrogen down within range, either by methylating it or detoxing it through a methylation pathway, and then take the level that's remaining, which is a more normal level, and that's what we'll use to match the bioidentical hormone level with. So remember, please do not over-supplement. When it comes to MTHFR, I would say at least a third, if not more, of the folks that I see the issue that they're suffering with is not MTHFR, it's over supplementation in an MTHFR body that cannot remove those supplements effectively. So again, if you want recommendations, uh, consider going over to the MTHFR store. I've tried to go through the products uh, with the folks over there and really pick out things that are safe. I think there's a lot of MTHFR safe products. So any place that you trust uh, is going to be good. And remember, in MTHFR, the concept, if some is good, more is better, that is not true. In the world of poor detoxifiers, less is better, okay? Uh, here are the resources, uh, and again, I have affiliations with all three, so just to disclose that to everybody over here, MTHFR store, so if you are trying to do MTHFR testing or COMT testing, uh, for catecholamines, uh, and if you're looking for supplements or the detox, if you want answers and solutions, we have a pretty comprehensive blog uh, that addresses all kinds of things. The things that we talked about today, so what is folic acid? What does it mean by comparison to folate? What is estrogen dominance? Uh, what do the different uh, genotypes for MTHFR actually mean? So a lot of that stuff is there. McKenzie has been writing a lot of papers and just, an, I think, a fantastic job getting some really clear information out there in a way that it's very, very understandable. And then finally, uh, again, I have a functional place. I think it's always best if you can find somebody functional close to you. But if you uh, want to come on down to Miami, you're welcome to, or uh, even telemedicine. And the time that you may want to think about you know, finding an expert is, if you've already been trying to manage MTHFR on your own, and remember, aside from MTHFR, uh, there's a lot of hormone dysregulations. So you may have thyroid issues, you may have blood sugar issues, 
you may have reproductive hormone issues. So you're going to want somebody in a functional clinic to help you with that. Uh, one point on body science, if you go to that website, it is not a .com. It is a .life, .life. I remember searching for .com. It was taken at the time and then thinking, huh, it's your life anyhow. Uh, we're a medical clinic that deals with the things that really affect your life. So let me get a, a, a .life for it. Uh, so it's a www.life for body science. And then I think that brings us to questions. So I'll tell you, I saw a couple come in and I printed the ones that you all put on Facebook. I've answered, I think, a lot of them as far as, and I'll read them for us so we can kind of take a look, but um, I saw a lot as far as miscarriages. So, you know, it's an estrogen dominant related issue. There's not enough progesterone to carry pregnancies to term. That's not always the case. There are so many reasons for miscarriages, uh, but because MTHFR has a number of hormone related issues and the double C copy can infer some clotting changes as well. Uh, you want to see a specialist that understands MTHFR or uh, see somebody like me before getting pregnant. Um, I saw the question, I have a C677T battling attention deficit as an adult. Uh, remember, it, I would tell you, it's not so much uh, OCD, attention deficit. Uh, I know we use a lot of those labels. I know I've used them here on this call as well, but just know it's really just poor focus, poor concentration, inability to think, and then just feeling like all this excess energy. Uh, it's usually after eating something that has folic acid. It is the most common way to turn this on or a recent exposure to a toxin, uh, being in a mall and walking past the store that sells perfume and then inhaling all that ester aldehyde. Uh, so especially if you find that focus concentration hyperactivity is occurring more at a certain part of the day, uh, consider that what you're eating prior to that may be the biggest issue. If you're eating cereal for breakfast, there's tons of folic acid in cereal that's been supplemented. And so afterwards, you're going to feel super MTHFR-ish. Uh, so just, again, make sure that there's nothing in your day-to-day -day routine that's causing it. Uh, I've been struggling for 10 years with insomnia and chronic fatigue. Uh, okay, so the insomnia, again, if we're talking about hormone-related changes that can occur commonly in focused MTHFR, both thyroid and estrogen dominant, so progesterone and testosterone when they're within range, good sleep, proper sleep with few wake-ups, and going right back to sleep afterwards. When estrogen becomes dominant because it's not methylated out properly, then uh, progesterone and or testosterone become too low by relative ratio and wake-ups start increasing. So whether you're trying to bind and remove estrogen, I normally like calcium deglucurate for that, uh, and that's on the, the MTHFR store page, uh, or whether you're trying to detoxify out estrogen with a, a P5.0 detox that we just looked at, or whether uh, the recommendation is being made to add progesterone because the progesterone level is so low by comparison. Um, that's usually a starting point as well. You always want to check thyroid dysregulation, fibromyalgia. Uh, it suggests water retention or thyroid-related issues. Uh, and so I would say it may be a mix of both estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone when it comes to reproductive hormones, as well as thyroid dysregulation. I've had lots of folks that have come on down with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue who had MTHFR. Uh, we resolved the hormone dysregulations and the fibromyalgia and or chronic fatigue resolved as a result. A young teenager, a C677T, homozygous, uh, and what's the best supplement? A couple things for me, I'm always gonna use pure methylation. It depends on body weight, I'm either going to be one cap in the day or one cap twice per day. I'd always refer to your physician, know that I'm not a physician. Uh, and so uh, that's usually my starting point. And there is something called MTHFR relief. That's the lozenge that I referred to. It is a fast acting uh, folate uh, supplement along with a methylated B12. So it's methylated folate, methylated B12. And for teenagers, they know when they're not feeling well. They know when they're frustrated at school because they can't think through a class. They know they're smart. They just don't know why they can't focus. So I always like that in the backpack. 
uh, in our office will always, of course, call the school and provide for the nurse an explanation of what the child has and why they have it. You want to advise your child. I think it's cherry flavored as a lozenge. It's not candy. You want to tell them that uh, and make sure they're not sharing it with their friends. I saw the question about MTHFR and Down syndrome. Uh, as far as I know, Down syndrome, of course, is a trisomy 21 mutation. I'm not aware that there's really a relationship over there. Um, supplements, miscarriages, and anesthesia. First of all, anesthesia falls in the category of something that oftentimes requires methylation. So people that have MTHFR can be more sensitive to anesthesia than others. Miscarriages we talked about. I will see routinely on MTHFR blogs uh, and through Facebook people that are trying to decide uh, antibiotics or anesthesia when they have MTHFR and they're talking to their doctor. I'd put a caution out there for sure and just say uh, you always want to advise your clinician that you have MTHFR. You always want to kind of hear them out. If they have a preference for a specific medication, uh, I would defer Oftentimes, once you feel, if you feel like they are educated in MTHFR, they understand the situation, and they still have a strong recommendation for a medication, I'll see people that are online talking about, for example, a child that's going in for surgery and asking what kind of anesthesia they should use and seeing a blog of lots of people, right, uh, that are making all kinds of recommendations. Be careful, guys. Just know at the end, I recognize the medical profession may not always be as up to date on some of the MTHFR related issues. If you find somebody and they're just not as up to date as you'd like, I encourage you to find somebody who is. But when it comes to serious medical situations, again, going for surgery and figuring out anesthesia, I'm going to always defer to a physician. Okay. And then, um, I can see somebody says, I'm totally confused on supplements. Again, a couple of things. Check out MTHFR Experts, that blog. It's a dot .com. Uh, it's a pretty good place to get the information. Uh, I did a lot of information videos on the MTHFR store, and the brand is Biome IQ. So even the Biome IQ website, uh, it's the only safe MTHFR brand that I'm aware of. Uh, again, I've used it for 10 years uh, safely with the MTHFR folks that come on into my office. Uh, so I know what to expect. So if you want more videos, when you click on a lot of the supplements over there, uh, you'll hear my explanation for it. Uh, and then let me see. Um, I was diagnosed uh, with heterozygous. What can I do to help my body? Again, I think we covered that. Let me just go now. I know a couple of you guys have asked a question. Let me see if there's any other questions that uh, were put on while we were talking. Hang on. Let me go to Q&A. Did I see something or I didn't? I thought I did. I thought I saw this coming up, but maybe not. No? Okay. So, again, I wasn't sure. Wait, let me check this one more time. Do, do you guys feel like I'm missing some computer savviness? Uh, I was feeling like that right about now. Hang on. Um, let me see. I want to make sure if you guys have any other questions. Okay, well, then I'll ask. I don't see anything else on my screen right now. And again, I've gone through most everything that I printed up. I'll take a look uh, one more time. Oh, I could see. Let's see. It's crazy. I could see my button clicking, and yet I can't see the questions. All right. Let me bring in uh, an expert over here. Hang on one sec, and let me see. Hey, thanks very much for your help. Okay, go to chat, huh? That's the advice. Here's the thing. I don't see chat on here. Hang on. I'm getting some help. Okay, severely allergic to co-workers' perfume. Uh, yeah, I get it. Um, oftentimes, for people with MTHFR, it's a heightened sense of toxic odors. And so for lots of us, we can't take uh, smells and odors. I would tell you, as far as a vitamin or supplement, if you're looking uh, just to reduce the headaches and fatigue that occur after uh, very toxic cleaning supplies or very toxic perfume kind of odors. I like molybdenum. Uh, it's a B vitamin. Molybdenum is very, very good at the ester aldehyde pathway. Uh, it can normally facilitate the removal of those kinds of toxins. I'd just be very straightforward. I'm sure you have been already by just telling them, hey, listen, 
Uh, I am very sensitive to smells. And again, it's not just perfume, it's cleaning solvents as well. So if you go into a place that's recently been cleaned, or if you go over to a place that has um, lots of new carpet that's outgassing, new cars, that kind of stuff uh, that is outgassing with benzenes, all of those kinds of things can be tough. So if you have a new car, roll down your windows ahead of time before you get in, let it outgas for about 10 minutes. If you've painted your house, again, any kind of odor like that, uh, you're really going to want to let it uh, kind of sit before you get in. All right, let's see. Um, that was the question on perfumes. Let me see if I can find the next. Guys, I tell you what, I use Zoom from time to time. You wouldn't know it from this, but I can see the questions showing up, uh, but I can't actually find them. Let me see. All right, so let me ask... Uh, here it is right over here. Anything else I can do for you guys? I think um, what I will do, if you're interested, I'll try and do these a little more routinely. Do let me know, please, on the Facebook page, a couple things. If you found it to be interesting, let me know just so I know you're interested more. Uh, if you have a topic that you want to discuss, let me know. Uh, if you found this to be something that's really covering a lot of stuff you already know, uh, tell me. I, I don't take offense, and I like the corrective criticism. So if you feel like there's something else that you want to talk about, uh, let me know. Um, let me think of what else. I think that's it. So listen, thanks so much for joining today. It was really a pleasure uh, to be on here with everybody. And uh, again, anything else that you need, I feel like it's probably easier for me to get on for an hour or so and run through questions rather than just trying to put a lot of comments on Facebook. Uh, commonly, I feel like those could be misunderstood or just can't get clear enough for somebody and really give you the information that you, that you need. So I'll see you again. If, if this is something that you like, let me know and I'll try and do it more frequently. All right, guys, have a great rest of your Saturday and thanks for joining.